Welcome, bienvenidos to today's core coffee chat on domestic violence prevention and response in Santa Cruz County in honor of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based or CORE Investments, along with Nicole Young. We're your host today. As you can hear, today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now and will also translate your written comments and questions. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Oscar Rios. I'll turn things over to Nicole Young, who's gonna give us a brief overview of core investments. Thanks, Nicole. So core investments, again, stands for the collective of results and evidence-based investments. And we think of it as kind of two parts of a whole. It's both a funding model and a broader movement to achieve equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. And CORE has evolved over several years based on a lot of input and insights that we've gathered from many partners in local governments, philanthropy, nonprofits, and community groups. And that collaborative process led to the CORE mission and vision that you see on the slide with equity at the center. And when we say things like equitable health and well-being, what we mean is that all people across the lifespan need to have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being. And we want to get to a place where people's opportunities and life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or other ways that people identify themselves. And so when we think of CORE as both a funding model and a broader movement, CORE really provides then a framework to align priorities and programs, policies, and funding, and our results around community-wide goals, and then work together to create these core conditions for health and well-being. And we put equity, keep equity at the center of the diagram just to remind us and also to visually illustrate that we have to uh, continuously examine and address individual, organizational, and systemic beliefs and practices, as well as the structures that are often the things that perpetuate the inequities that we're trying to eliminate. And so coffee chats uh, uh, like today and other trainings that we host or offered are available through the CORE Institute for Innovation and Impact. So we like to think of the CORE Institute as the learning arm of CORE Investments, where we offer an array of training, technical assistance, and other learning opportunities, and often just create the space for people across different sectors to come and learn together and build the knowledge and skills and systems that we need to fulfill that collective vision of an equitable, thriving, and resilient community. So again, we encourage you to share your comments and questions in the chat along the way. Uh, we will share links to the video recordings in both English and Spanish and the bilingual slides in a follow-up email. Usually it takes us a few days to prepare the videos and just make sure everything that we're posting on the CORE website meets all of the Americans with Disabilities Act accessibility standards, but they will be available. I'll turn it back to Nicole to introduce our guests. Thanks, Nicole. So we're gonna start with some um, information from Monarch Services from Maria Barranco and Esmeralda Torres, and I will turn it over to them and um, just let me know if I'm not moving the slides at the right pace. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Nicole. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here and joining us today during this month for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Such a crucial month to learn more about not uh, only Monarch Services and Walnut Avenue Women's Center, but also to learn about domestic violence. Um, my name is Maria, and I'm one of the directors with Monarch Services. Good morning, Esmeralda Torres with uh, also Monarch Services. Great. 
for those of you who may be familiar with Monarch Services and those for you who are learning about Monarch Services, Monarch Services has been a haven for individuals who are survivors of, of sexual assault, human trafficking, and domestic violence for 47 years. Pre previously, we were known as um, Women's Christ Support the Mujer women's Christ support the Fenta de Mujeres, and we changed our name in 2013 as we wanted to make sure that we were equitable in the services that we were providing to all of our survivors. Our mission is lives free from violence and abuse, and this is where the point that we want to get to. Um, hopefully, you know, in the future, we're hoping that there will be no violence and abuse in our communities. Monarch's mission is to empower all those individuals, uh, families, and our communities to take action against violence and abuse. This is why we're here today, to talk about what can we do, what type of services we offer, and what can we do as a community to end that violence. Briefly, I'm going to go over some of our um, services, and then we're going to go more in depth on specific uh, services that are newer to the community or you may not be familiar with. Now, because we're not going to go in depth at every single um, program, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. One of the uh, programs that we have is our 24-hour crisis and support line. We have over 15 advocates, backup managers, leads, on-call advocates, um, volunteers and shelter case managers who are supporting our crisis support line. We are 24 seven, seven days a week. Uh, through our crisis and support line, we offer a, a uh, you know, information and referrals. We're there to provide support and connect our survivors to, or those who call to the different resources that are available, either internal or external. We also have a 24 hour emergency response, um, what we call call outs. Our advocates who are 24 hours, seven days a week are ready to be able to respond to any hospitals, clinics, um, or any jurisdictions or safe locations. They may be able to respond to your um, organization as well, as long as it is a safe place for them to be able to meet with a survivor. Um, our advocates respond to provide not only information and support, but just to be there and be able to listen to the survivor, right? To make sure that the survivor's rights are being met, that if advocacy is needed during that time of that call, that we're there to be able to support them. Um, unfortunately to say many of our survivors who have experienced trauma have a difficult time um, advocating for themselves. And this is exactly what our advocates um, are there for. If you ever come across anyone who may need um, an advocate, please feel free to give us a call at our crisis and support line. In addition, we have our sexual assault response team. Um, we are the only uh, sexual assault response team in Santa Cruz County, the, rape, the only rape crisis center in Santa Cruz County. And therefore we collaborate with various organizations who work with sexual assault survivors, which include um, law, all the different jurisdictions with law enforcement in Santa Cruz County. It includes UCSC, Monarch Services, um, forensic examiners, um, the DA and so on. But with sexual assault response, we are able to respond to any sexual assault that may, may occur uh, within immediately or if it had occurred um, within 10 days of the assault. Survivors have options and we'll go through those options um, at a later slide. We wanna make sure that if you are one of those first responders, that you please make sure that first off, we believe our survivors and connect them to Monarch Services to ensure that they are receiving or exploring the options that they feel comfortable um, following through at that moment. I will go in depth more with our emergency confidential shelter. We are the only confidential shelter in Santa Cruz County and Pajaro Valley. Uh, we're going to go more in depth with crisis intervention program and all the different programs that fall under our crisis intervention. And then our legal um, program and assistance as well. In addition, we will go also um, be discussing in regards to one of our most newer programs, um, our positive solution programs. And Esmeralda will be going um, through that program extensively. We'll also uh, review in regards to our child and youth program and our prevention program. Um, very briefly, we'll go over our volunteer and internship program.
Okay, so our crisis intervention program serves anyone who comes into our offices, any um, anyone who identifies as a victim or survivor and uh, would like further assistance in just kind of talking about what's happening, receiving more information, counseling support. Um, we do a lot of case management. Um, there's short-term and long-term depending on what individuals need. We also provide um, advocacy and connection to other resources because we wanna ensure that our survivors have um, you know, that we create wraparound services for them so that they can be able to target all of the different areas um, that they need. Um, through core funding, we're able to provide therapy services um, that, you know, for those individuals that have more complex trauma that our case managers, um, you know, it's, it's the work out of the scope, then we're able to refer to therapy. Um, we have two support groups as well, English and Spanish. Um, they're all gendered and they are also run by um, some of our contracted therapists. Our in-custody program and safe release is some of our new program in our crisis intervention um, program here at Monarch. Our in-custody programming came out of need um, through uh, the JAG committee. So in our community, we realized that women in different settings face different disparities, different needs. And there was um, work to be done while women are in custody. Um, this work started about 10 years ago when we just started getting calls of women who were in custody, wanting to receive services due to domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, you know, a lot of the times when people are in custody, they just have time and start thinking about, you know, what their life is, what brought them there. Sometimes it could be like a domestic violence incident or a sexual assault. And um, there was a need for it. There was a cry for that type of help. So uh, we did what Monarch does and we responded. Eventually, we were able to get a contract with the jail. So we provide counseling supportive services um, to women who are in custody. Part of that work is that we are also the PREA responders. So PREA star, uh, stands for Prison Rape Elimination Act. Um, so anyone, regardless of gender, who wants to report um, sexual assault or harassment while they are in custody, um, they have a right to do so. And we are the responders for that. We're their advocates through that process and ensure that they um, the report is being taken seriously and followed through. Um, and part of that component was then when um, the safe release program came into play as well. So for women specifically who are being released um, from custody sometimes have a challenge in not being able to enter different programming or not being, um, you know, um, from the area and or even if they are, some of their connections have been lost because of incidents that have happened or just because of how long they've been in custody for. So in order to have women be released out into the community, have a safe place to go, have time to connect, whether it was with services, SLEs or family, they just needed a, a, a place to go to. So we created this program. This um, happens where they can call their crisis line while they're still in custody. Um, they get connected to us and we are able to provide them a one night motel voucher. For different situations, different circumstances, some of them can be vouchered for longer, but it starts off with one night. Um, and as they work with a case manager, um, the length of uh, stay is determined based on that. Um, that's very helpful because again, that gives people in, in a safe place to go to, connect them with resources, um, let them, lets them know like where they can go to get additional support. And then if they want to, you know, enroll in the crisis intervention program, then they can do so. And then I will talk about our positive solutions program in a later slide. Our legal program, um, we have a paralegal and a legal advocate that help individuals who come to our agency and or are referred for legal assistance. 
Um, we, our advocates talk about them thoroughly about what the process is, what are the requirements, um, trying to gather any evidence um, that they can for their uh, situation. And then we also help, we prioritize emergency protective orders. So if someone had an incident um, that was recent, we try to bring them in um, sooner than later. And we also have our paralegal works with our immigration attorney um, for anyone who qualifies for a U visa, T visa, or VAWA. Thank you, Asmi. As I mentioned earlier, um, we have our, the only confidential shelter in Santa Cruz County and Pajaro Valley. It's called Mariposa House. It is located in a safe, um, confidential location as we want to ensure that all survivors who come into our home are feeling safe from leaving a situation that unfortunately was either they were in imminent danger or they just um, were unsafe. Um, we take all gender identities regardless of the, everyone's welcome. Um, if anyone is in need of confidential shelter, they can just call our crisis and support line. There is a process that we want to make sure uh, we understand the need of the survivor. So we do what we call a screening. Uh, once we do a screening, we meet with them in person. Uh, it's also important to note that if any service providers or support persons or other entity calls on behalf of survivor, we will request to speak directly to survivor. What we found um, in many of these situations is that sometimes survivors are not ready to leave a situation or are not ready to come into our uh, confidential shelter. So we want to hear directly from the survivor in regards to what are their needs um, and what support do they they need also uh, to discuss in regards to the fact that because we're the only confidential shelter in Santa Cruz County and we can't, um, we cannot disclose the location. We try to understand more about where do they work and is this going to work for them uh, transportation wise as well. Um, we have advocates on site, case managers and advocates on site um, from from 8 a.m., sometimes 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. This is our case managers who work directly with our survivor who resides at our confidential shelter. Part of our program is to provide programming, case management, um, support groups, house meetings, thera therapeutic services to adults and children. Um, we also provide a life skills um, and life skills can vary from how to cook a meal, healthy meal to how to clean um, to how to really care for yourself. Um, and that that's important, right? Um, many of our survivors who come into our shelter, unfortunately, did not have the opportunity to have healthy life skills or learn healthy life skills. And in addition, of course, our program provides an opportunity for survivors to heal. The healing um, part of being in our program is very, very essential. Uh, all survivors who come into our program uh, do have private family rooms. Um, it is a shared bathroom and it is, it is a communal living environment. So, so therefore, when we're screening uh, a survivor who may come into our shelter, we do talk about the fact that, again, it's shared um, communal living environment. And if they're willing to work in a communal uh, living environment, of course, they, they are welcome to come into our program. We house up to seven families and 21 single individuals. Um, there are times that we do receive very large families. So at that point, we do need to accommodate them into different rooms. Every, every case scenario is very unique and very different. It is important to note that we do prioritize our Santa Cruz County um, survivors, given that because there is an imminent danger here in Santa Cruz, we want to make sure that they're safe. Um, the length of stay in our program is on a case by case. Every case is very unique and very different. Uh, we make sure that um, that we work extensively with our survivors to understand what their needs are. Uh, we've had some survivors who have been in our program for a couple of weeks, others for three months, six months. We've we have one family right now who has been there for a whole year. Now, um, what makes every case different is 
about the fact that we want to make sure that there is more affordable housing, right? As we know, affordable housing is a huge problem in Santa Cruz County. So we do connect them to all the different services in our in our area. Um, as I mentioned, there are educational uh, workshops in our in facility. I will briefly um, go over our on-call program. Our on-call program is one of the programs where we respond to all the different calls in person, um, hospitals and clinics. We respond to sexual assaults. Um, survivors are able to call us, um, nurses or hospital staff, law enforcement to contact Monarch Services and an advocate will be present at all times during the forensic examination. We respond to domestic violence um, reports, what we call domestic violence response team, and any human trafficking stings or human trafficking incidents as well. We respond to law enforcement for interviews. Um, we go to the Sky Center where it's, um, and es Esme is going to talk a little bit more further in regards to that. Uh, we respond to all domestic violence response, uh, pretext calls, and uh, just anything that's advocacy. And then again, we also respond to at any time um, for shelter, motel, and safe release screenings. And this could be at 2 a.m. in the morning. And of course, we also provide 24-hour um, uh, referrals. Thank you, Maria. So the Positive Solutions Program is something that started, I want to say, around uh, six years ago. Um, we, you know, in Monarch, we always served, you know, our survivors, um, people who wanted to come in for help. But one common thing that um, most of the survivors who were in intimate uh, partner relationships were that they wanted help for their partner. A lot of people are not ready to leave the relationship and that's not something that we promoted, but it was like a lot of safety planning and it was like, okay, well, how can we help families more holistically? How can we help them, um, you know, receive the services that the family wants? And Monarch went on a scavenger hunt and looking for a program that would um, help the, the person who causes harm. So we came across this positive solutions program it is an alternative to, alternative to the 52-week Better Intervention Program because it is uh, facilitated in a different manner. Um, we have weekly two-hour meetings. We offer them in English and Spanish. Um, and really, it's just processing with individuals uh, childhood traumas. So we do ACEs pre and post. Um, but it's processing those childhood traumas and helping them understand how are they showing up as dysfunctional adults. Um, we have pretty a lot of success with it. Our groups are small. Um, we do get referrals, uh, voluntary referrals. We get um, referrals from the court and child protective services as well. Next slide, please. So our children and youth program um, is, uh, we see children aged four to age uh, 17. It provides, uh, it mirrors the adult um, program. So a lot of one-on-one -on -one case management, uh, therapy, support groups. But what I wanted to highlight here is our, um, that our program also responds to the Sky Center. So Sky stands for um, safe kids and youth. So children who, uh, where there's an incident um, that is being reported, there's a specific facility where children can or teens can go in and may have one report done so that they don't have to be telling the story or the situation of what happened altogether. So in that setting, um, there's different entities that take part of it. Monarch responds to mostly all of them as the victimizations uh, mostly fall within our uh, core services. Um, so we probably respond to anywhere from like three to seven in a week. Um, it just really varies. Um, and then we also respond to the Children's Advocacy Center in Santa Cruz County for any forensic examinations. Next slide, please. We have a, an education and community outreach. So anything from presentations, tablings, trainings, all of that to anyone that... Um, would like to know more information or collaborate with us. Hey, and this is one of our um, 
again, our program, Campo Seguros. So Campo Seguros initiated back in 2013. Um, and the goal was to empower, or the goal is to empower our farm working communities. This is one of our communities that it's um, for most part being forgotten. Uh, they have so many um, challenges in seeking services. So therefore we wanted to make sure that we went to them, uh, that we met our survivors where they were at. So Campo Seguros um, began during that time. Our farm workers face so many obstacles in various situations and Monarch was able to see that through not only collaborations, but also through the work that we were doing, especially when they were seeking um, either information or support or resources, not only the lack of resources, but also just the knowledge of what is available to them. Um, Campo Seguros also focuses on providing support and information to all those um, in the community uh, who are victims of survivor or survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. Campos it has now expanded to really work more uh, exclusively with um, not only our Campos Seguros, but also indigenous, um, with the indigenous communities. We want to make sure that we are reaching to all the different communities that are, are you know, difficult to to, to reach. Um, it is not only a program that provides support, but it's also a platform that encourages and nature's, uh, nurtures community le and leadership. So the goal is that we hold um, chats or cafecito style um, workshops where we are educating about the different topics, domestic violence, healthy relationships, not only at home, but also in the workplace. And at the same time, we are not only empowering, but educating and becoming a, a leader. Um, the goal is to work with our campesinos or our farm workers to eventually at some someday them being, um, you know, those leaders who can go back and bring that information to their um, to, to the, their people. Um, if you need to contact us, these are this is our information. We have our crisis and support line 24 hours a day, seven days a week, bilingual, free. Um, and then Watsonville office. We have um over at East Lake, we have one in Santa Cruz County. And then, of course, if you have any questions about our confidential shelter, you can always call us through our crisis and support line. Thank you, Maria and Esmeralda. In the interest of time, I'm going to move us along, but I will encourage everyone to please submit any questions for any of our presenters um, in the chat. Nicole Young and I will collect them and we'll have an opportunity to, um, to pose those questions after the presentation from Julie Masasevic and Lynn Boulay from Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center. So thank you and here we go. All right, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Maria and Esmeralda. Um, good morning, my name is Julie Masasevic. I'm the Executive Director of Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center and I'm joined today with our Department Director, Lynn Boulay. We're gonna be taking turns um, with these slides. Um, next slide, our presentation is looking, is gonna look like this. We're going to do an overview um, of Walnut Avenue services. Um, first, we're gonna briefly review the role of what Walnut Avenue does in terms of services for survivors. Then we're gonna highlight our restorative justice program. Then I have two relatively new projects that I wanna share with you. Um, because I think it's really relevant as we as we think about in the future, how do we want to work ourselves out of jobs? What is the data telling us and what are other communities doing um, to uh, address these issues? So the mission of Walnut Avenue Family and Women's Center is to end cycles of trauma, support lifelong learning, and promote healthy relationships with oneself and others. We are a multi-service organization. We have two primary areas of service focus. We have an early education department and we have what we call our advocacy and prevention department. That's mostly what we'll focus on today. And then for both of those departments, we try within reason to wrap families with support so that they have the capacity to access our services. So that's our family support services programs. 
And so an example I can give of that is, you know, if, if a, if a parent has no childcare or is concerned about putting food on the table for dinner tonight, it's very difficult to show up for a support group. And so what we try to do, um, we have a family night every Thursday and we provide a meal, family style meal, and we provide childcare. This enables um, a person who really wants that support to show up and be able to participate in our support group. So we're really um, proud of our family night. Next slide. Um, so all of our services are strength-based and voluntary. Um, they are all based on the knowledge that we are aware of about how trauma manifests in communities and in individuals. They're also free and inclusive. And so just wanted to make a comment particularly about the inclusive because we know that Walnut Avenue sometimes gets pegged as a women's center. Um, but of course, we know that intimate partner violence occurs in all types of relationships and in fact happens disproportionately in higher numbers with non-binary folks. And transgender adults are twice as likely as cisgender adults to report a history of physical or sexual intimate partner violence. This is data out of the 2023 California Violence Experiences Survey, otherwise known as CalVex. So obviously women are not all that we serve. We serve all ages and all genders. So it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, so here's just a quick definition of what that means. Domestic violence is an escalating pattern of coercive behavior in which one person in a relationship gains and maintains control over another. And there are multiple different ways. A lot of times people think of the physical abuse, but we know that domestic violence or intimate partner violence can be mental or emotional abuse, it can be verbal abuse, it can be physical and or sexual abuse, it can be financial, technological, there is a use of isolation, um, use of one's privilege, and also children and pets can be used um, in these patterns of coercive control. So I'm gonna hand over to um, Lynn to talk a little bit of what services Walnut Avenue provides. Um, hello, so I'm Lynn Boulay. I'm the director here at Walnut Avenue. And some of the services for survivors that we provide are legal advocacy for restraining orders, and that can be domestic, uh, domestic violence restraining orders or elder abuse restraining orders. We can help with the paperwork, we can help with the filing, and we have advocates in court every Thursday morning for family court in which we can assist those who are already coming into our center. But we also have a great um, relationship with the judges and they know that we are there and they can request our assistance. They can say there's advocates here in the, in the gallery if you would like help and we can, uh, we help quite a few uh, folks that way. Um, we do have support groups, and Julie mentioned our Thursday night, which is a very, very successful. In fact, we are pretty maxed out on that one. Um, but we have an English group and a Spanish group going simultaneously in different rooms. And then we have our kids club, which is childcare for the evening. And again, we serve a light meal beforehand and people have a chance to build some community. Domestic violence creates a, a sense of isolation in many of the participants. And so this is a chance to go and meet other people who have similar situations and they can find support between one another. Um, we also have a LGBTQ um, support group on Tuesday nights. That's a virtual group. We also do a process group on Tuesday afternoons, and we um, do support groups in 
Blaine, uh, the Blaine Street Jail, and also at probation um, at the juvenile hall. So we want to make sure that everyone is getting this great information. We do one-on-one -on -one peer advocacy, including parenting support. So we do have drop-in hours. So if you know someone, they can come to Walnut Avenue between, they can see an advocate between 10 and 1 every day of the week. And then they can also come in and make an appointment. We have two um, wonderful women that work our front office who have been doing this for years and welcome everyone that comes through the door as if they're family and helps people out, whether it's something that's actually in our lane or not. They're excellent at just being a community of support. Um, parenting support is just our advocates are trained in positive discipline. They have had the um, teacher training in that. So if participants are interested in working with an advocate around some of their parenting issues, um, that is something that we can help them with. And of course, we have our 24-hour um, crisis line. So that is 24-7, 365. And that is how most people can reach us after hours. We also have our community education and outreach where we go to other agencies, uh, school groups, um, clubs, and talk to people. We also do training. We train nurses at the clinics. We train um, officers at the, at the police department. So there's all kinds of opportunities for us to get the word out to um, other agencies in the county. So oh, community education. Yeah, so we do DB training for service providers, uh, peer support and ally training for community members. A lot of uh, folks that call us on our 24-hour uh, crisis line are allies or people who want to have more information so that they can help friends and family. We do education. We go to education-based groups. And we do the domestic violence advocacy certification training twice a year. And we're starting a new one in person this month on uh, October 25th. And there's still room if anyone is interested in doing that. So other programs for our survivors of domestic violence is our housing and employment program. And this is um, a HUD program. This is not something that we advertise in the community because it is a referral to this program. It, the, the referrals to this program are internal. So obviously there are such, there's such a need for housing in our county. And so it is hard to prioritize who gets these um, services, but we do have a housing and employment program where we have case management and opportunities for people that are fleeing domestic violence to get rapidly rehoused in a safe environment, them and their families. So that is an excellent program. I just wish it could be for more people. And then we have our Space for Change, which is a restorative justice program. We've had this for a few years. It's still, you know, in its infancy, really. Um, when we were trained to do Space for Change some years back, um, we had an idea of what it's going to look like. But that has changed as the program has progressed. So but it is it gives a opportunity for alternatives to law enforcement. And I think there's more slides on that moving forward. Julie, are you gonna take it from here or did you, is this still me? <laughs> You're still, this is still you. All righty, thank you. So <laughs> uh, we do have services for children and youth, our kids club, which is uh, basically, child care for when folks are either in 
an appointment, maybe they have gone to court or for our support groups. Um, and that's ages zero to 11, although sometimes kids are a little bit older, they still come. Our teen services, we have a teen group that meets every week and we have a youth advisory board where young people can communicate to us what their needs in their families and their communities um, are looking like and how can we respond to that. So that's very helpful. We also do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. So this is a program that advocates meet with a, with a youth one-on-one. -on -one. This is not for any um, goal setting. It is a chance for a child to spend some time with another safe adult. And if it's just playing a game one day, that's fine. It doesn't, we don't have expectations for them or benchmarks. This is a chance for kids to be able to feel comfortable, have a place to come, and eventually they do start sharing quite a bit. But we do not coordinate with the parent on any set goals. This is really about what the child, what the youth wants, and what will be most beneficial for them. And it's it's off, off, sometimes just a safe place to do crafts or something like that. Um, and then we have our school-based workshops where we do healthy, um, healthy relationship workshops in the middle schools, the junior highs and the high schools. And this we do throughout the, the school year. And we have several people that go out. And these are this is a very successful program because we reach thousands of kids. Next slide. There's your slide. All right. So quickly, while most folks know us best for our services for survivors, we've actually been doing early education services for over 50 years. We have the only subsidized early education center in the city of Santa Cruz. It's located up behind Santa Cruz High. Next slide. Our early education program is bilingual Spanish and inclusive of special needs children. We have a mental health consultant on staff to support our families and teachers. And for us, early childhood education is really the beginning of this continuum for teaching healthy relationships during the most impactful years of brain development and social emotional development. We know there are many intervention points across the lifespan, but we feel that these first five years are crucial and can set someone up for success. Um, I think we can forward through these. We're not gonna have time to go through the early education. So um, Lynn, you're gonna touch on family support services and then with the space for change slides, we're gonna have to move pretty quickly or skip Alrighty. that info just to give you the time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so with our family support services, we touched on that earlier and we have a food pantry for um, participants in both a early education center and for survivors that they can come once a week and get fresh produce and canned goods and you know dry goods and also toiletries, that sort of thing. We have a lot of resources from our community members that donate to us. We can move on. So Space for Change is a collaboration between Walnut Avenue and the Conflict Resolution Center, who has been doing this kind of work for years. So it is a collaborative restorative justice program. Um, why are we doing this? Well, because this field has recognized the need for new approaches that the conventional interventions have not ended DV. Um, we have seen that the batterers intervention programs don't have much 
oversight, regulation, or success. And so this is another option so that folks can participate in an accountability process that might be more beneficial for them. We can move to the next slide. So community accountability is any variety of community-based strategies of addressing harm that occurs within a community without external state entities, i.e. law enforcement. So for a lot of folks, it is not safe. The, the police department <laughs> interventions are not safe. It makes it worse. And some people don't want to leave their situation. They actually want it just to get better. So this is an opportunity. And this is um, based on the victim or the survivor's needs. Those are paramount and those come first, even above, let's see, identified harm that has done in addressing the needs of persons have been harmed and the persons who caused harm to heal may or may not involve state entities. So well, basically it's more important that the victim or our survivor gets the process they want and they can control it if they want it to stop at any time. So there are different ways of, of um, addressing this, but these are the underlying principles that violence is a choice and a learned behavior, which means change is possible under certain conditions. The occurrence of violence involves social and collective factors in addition to individual choice, and that violence impacts more than just the survivor. There is no one approach offers justice to everyone's solution. And that last one is really the point that this is an alternative to some of the other um, options that are out there. This is not court ordered. This is, um, this is uh, something that is voluntary. Um, so state entity involvement causes more harm than benefit. In some cases, yes. Removing the person causing harm from the community is not always the safest or most appropriate response because that person has not gotten the opportunity to change or gotten any resources to change. They're just going to continue the behaviors if nothing is in, if there's no intervention. And punishment is neither justice nor the impetus for change. So even though this is not a batter's intervention program per se, there have been several judges that have approved this program for folks that they have had in court and decided that this was um, eligible for them to go through. So the goals are for survival safety, always the highest priority, priority even over the transformation of a person who's caused harm. So accountability and transformation of person causing harm, which we have seen. This is an amazing thing to watch. Accountability in surrounding community and change in community and social factors allowing violence to occur. So it is, It is. we'd like to talk about the fact that it may be between two folks that may have been had the initial contact, but the the range that it goes through fr friends and families and neighbors and the community are all affected by this violence. And so if we can bring some of those stakeholders in, um, it can actually be quite powerful. So it came from a creative interventions toolkit. Um, and we have, we were uh, trained in this some years back. And it mirrors other formats that were pioneered by Black, Indigenous, and other historically marginalized communities, through, uh, which is adapted to limitations of being nonprofits. Um, so we've had to adapt it to some degree. But this is 
this is the way communities have been doing this for centuries. My background is in anthropology, and this is this is what they've been doing for thousands of years, where your community comes together to address the problem. And sometimes the the person that is causing harm needs the most attention. And that's where some of this comes from. You can change the slide. So there are three categories in the service and there are healing circles, which are survivors and their loved ones, which come together and it's a process of healing. And it may not involve the person that caused harm at all, but this is a process for survivors to be feel more whole, feel more like themselves again, and to be able to move on. There's ally education where we talk with family members, we talk with um, friends and help them to be able to support those that they love. And then there's the accountability process that the person that is causing harm goes through and can self-reflect and make some changes. And this is, we've seen people be really, uh, take a real positive um, approach to this. So um, it's, it's a change and it's different than what the court systems have been doing for years and years. And we're hoping that we will have this just grow and grow more and more because I think it's a very healthy way of approaching this. So if you wanted to be referred um, as a voluntary program, it's self-referral. Um, potential participants can contact um, Marjorie Coffey here at Walnut Avenue. And but without a release of information, Walnut Avenue cannot initiate contact with potential, potential participants. We have had people call up and say, we want so-and-so to go through this process, <laughs> but we need to have that person talk to us. All Thanks, right, Lynn, I'm, I'm going to suggest that maybe we um, share some of the other great information that you have in the slides and just turn to the um, the data project that you wanted to Yeah, share. thank you. Okay. We're just running a little short of time, unfortunately, and I also wanna make sure we have time for anyone's questions. So maybe we can return in a few minutes. All right. But thank you, this is exciting to hear about. Can you actually go to the um, the the Family Justice Center slide just for- Sure. Because I can share the time between the Family Justice Center and the, and the data project. Okay. Uh, back one. Back one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, back another one. Okay. Oh, there we go. That way. Okay. I just quickly wanted to share because we're very excited about this new project. And um, this is a collaboration between Walnut Avenue and Monarch Services. Um, and so coming out of several different collective impact um, movements in Santa Cruz County over the last eight or nine years, um, probably most significantly the shared safety work group um, that United Way was facilitating Sarah Emmert at the United Way. Um, we have a huge um, chunk of data and research and focus groups with uh, folks with lived experience that have pointed us in this direction. Um, so the Family Justice Center um, model opened in San Diego in 2002, and now it's in 43 different states and 25 different countries. Um, and it's really designed to bring victim advocates, legal support, government assistance, prosecutors, law enforcement, um, et cetera, into one location. Again, it's that victim, that survivor-centered care um, for the way that the, the person who developed this model describes it is for, you know, dec decades, we have been designing programs based on what's convenient for service providers. And what we need to be doing is really focusing on that survivor centered care. Um, and so I, the next slide, what I provided in the slide 
show you can see it comes from um, the Family Justice Center Impact Report of 2021. These are some quotes uh, based on the data that comes out of this model. Um, so you can move to the next one, I think is a good one to highlight. 100% um, of survivors in more than 230 focus groups conducted by the Alliance for Hope International consistently say they'd like to be able to go to one place for help instead of having to go from agency to agency telling their story over and over again. Um, next slide, here's a quote from a survivor. Family justice centers are leading the way forward in the domestic violence movement. They're challenging us to think outside the box, to keep growing, changing, and evolving as we work to prevent family violence. So, um, a funding, so after we, we have done all of this work and our, our local data is pointing us in a particular direction, a grant opportunity came to light and I approached um, Monarch and we worked uh, together for several weeks to put an application together and we were awarded a grant. So we will be working over the next um, 18 months on developing a family justice center in collaboration with their stakeholders, with survivors. Um, so that of course could be an entire presentation in itself. Um, so we'll save that for another time, but I just wanted to touch on that because it's super um, exciting. And then if we want to move to, these are ways to get involved for DVAM. Um, the next slide is about how to be an ally, which folks can dig into when the slide show comes out and then we can move over to the data project. So the data project, this is another project that we've kind of been working on behind the scenes for over a year now. Um, when the Domestic Violence Commission kind of stopped functioning many years ago, we, we lost a really important aspect of collaboration, which was our intention of shared data. So um, I started talking with, with Sarah Marshall after a subcommittee of the Justice and Gender Commission um, and expressing that this sense of great loss that when the Domestic Violence Commission kind of stopped functioning, that this was a huge loss. And she said to me, oh, well, I'd like to help you with that. Um, and so we started this kind of grassroots projects and, and we have all these amazing, awesome organizations here in Santa Cruz that are working their butts off with, with survivors, but we can't analyze our data as a countywide, um, as a whole county. And so this is about us coming together, creating a model where we can pull the various entities together um, and look at data as a whole. Um, so we saw the, the different partners that were involved in that. We've got the, um, the Commission to End Violence Against Women. We've got um, our SART team, um, a representative from the county. We have the DA's office. We have uh, Santa Cruz PD, uh, we have the care office from UCSC, um, and of course, Monarch Services. And so this, I just want to say that this is the very beginning of the project. And so what we are doing now is really saying, hey, if, there, if you know of other buckets of data um, that should be taken into consideration, um, please bring it to our awareness. This is why data for prevention. So we really believe that un in order for us to deeply understand the issues that we are dealing with in this community, we need to look at all the data and be able to compare apples to apples and speak the same language. So this is about bringing multiple stakeholders together so that we can speak to the data as a whole. Again, um, we acknowledge the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women um, for giving us a little bit of money to um, support this project. Um, and then here's our goal. The long-term goal is to carefully and systematically develop a few standard measures for the county. Um, we have had data share at some of our meetings as well. We'd like this data to be available 
um, to the community. The idea is perhaps an annual um, report to the community. This is what this is what the work looks like in our community as a whole, um, so that we can then take that data and really work towards effective prevention and intervention. And so, um, what are we working towards? Understanding the situation, um, focusing our prevention work, and again, aggregating that data for the purpose of prevention and advocacy. And then on the last, on the next slide, how can you be involved? So we have a survey that we can share. Um, this does not ask you to share your specific data. It is a more generalized, where should we be gathering data from? What kind of data is being collected? What are the gaps in the data? This is really just setting us up for what are the next steps in this um, project as we move it forward. Um, and then the last slide is really about who to contact. So you can, there's the survey link, which we could share in the chat. And then um, for right now, the contacts are myself um, with Walnut Avenue, um, Gabriella, um, who was a commissioner um, on CPVAW and um, has helped us get funding and start a website for this project. And then Sarah Marshall, who has helped create the survey and really um, is starting to work on this report that we're hoping to, to share out. So hopefully I didn't go too fast <laughs> there, but that is, uh, that is the data prevention project. Thank you to all of you. Um, I know we had to rush you a little bit there at the end and apologies for that. I didn't see any um, questions come in the chat, but if anyone who's on the call has, has questions for any of our presenters or presenters, if you have questions for each other, but what you've been hearing, um, we have a few minutes for that before we wrap up. Um, any any questions from the group? Comments? No questions from my end. Okay. Things you'd like to hear more about in the future? We, we would definitely love to have all of you back for updates on all of these um, initiatives and, and projects. I was wondering about the Family Justice Center. That's super exciting. Um, would it include a building merger or would Walnut and Monarch still have their buildings? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I think that remains to be seen. We, we are hoping that our partners at the County of Santa Cruz might say, here's a space <laughs> that's available. But the idea, you know, and obviously in, in an ideal world, we would have a South County Family Justice Center in a North County because we know transportation is a real challenge. Um, but we thought, well, let's just get this started. The idea is first to have a central mid-county location where we would be facilitating transportation as needed, going where people are or providing transportation to bring people to us. But like I said, just because of the way our um, county is, we probably ideally have two centers. Um, I did approach Cal OES about that, the funder, and I said, really, if you understand the way the geography of, of how um, Santa Cruz works, these are our specific needs. But the model itself is really about one centralized center. But San Diego as a model now has three. And so, I mean, San Diego is obviously much bigger. So that's the, you know, 10-year goal. We're going to start out now with one <laughs> and see where it leads us. Great. Thanks for the question, Emery. Any other questions, comments, et cetera? Okay, well, feel free to keep sharing those in the chat. As I mentioned, all of these materials will be shared and feel free to distribute them in your networks to get the word out about both the contact information for, for these organizations, but also for just the descriptions of the programs that we went through pretty quickly today. Um, and thanks so much to our speakers, Maria Esmeralda, Julie and Lynn, we appreciate all of the work you did to bring this information to a broader audience. And thanks to Oscar and Gisela for helping us provide this information in Spanish. 
and to Nicole for working on all the slides, of which there were many. So we appreciate the group effort and we look forward to convening again on these really important topics and to hearing more progress. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole to share about some upcoming events and how you can give us some feedback on this session so we can do more of this. So we have another event scheduled in November, and this is um, one of our joint trainings that we do with DataShare Santa Cruz County. Um, so we're planning it together and we're actually featuring in November uh, presenters from the Community Economic Mobilization Initiative, CME, uh, which is a collaborative initiative um, through UCSC's uh, Institute for Social Transformation and um, USC and Policy Link. And so they do a lot of work around um, basically like community organizing and power building and uh, civic engagement all around try to, trying to um, both inform and shape local policies um, as well as implement programs and be able to bring in additional resources into local communities to really support community economic mobilization. So the they're going to be talking about how they approach data and using data, using values and really coming at it from like a data justice lens. And so we're working on flushing out the agenda with them as we speak and encourage you to register for that. Um, and hopefully you can join us for the live session. And then for today's session, we always appreciate feedback about uh, both the content the process, just kind of the uh, what was useful about it, and as well as other topics that you'd like to see or hear more about in the future. So we ask you to fill out the feedback survey. You can do that um, once you leave the meeting. You can either click on the link in the chats or scan the QR code if you have a smartphone with a camera app. 